I wanted to talk about what I think uh, is an interesting epoch and doesn't require a lot of math. Yeah, and it should be something you know. It's called uh, the Cosmic Dawn or the Dawn Cosmique. I don't know how to say it in French. How, how would you spell it in French? Like that? Close enough? Okay. So it's also known as the epoch of reionization. And the reason is we think that between the time we can see the cosmic microwave background, right, which is the surface which is roughly 380,000 years after the beginning of the universe, until the first galaxies and stars are forming, the quasars and so forth, until they're forming, we call this the dark ages, because there is nothing emitting light to first order. Right? So if we were looking in the visible or were we looking at almost any wavelength band, we just see the cosmic angry background and we see passing through, but we don't see any objects very much. And that isn't quite true. And so to study that, <coughs> I've talked briefly before about the quasars, and I mentioned that I think the gamma ray bursts are maybe a way to probe part of this era, because the gamma ray bursts may start, certainly the, the ones from the core collapse supernova will start very early, because the very massive stars have very short lives because they burn so much. So you expect if that's what they are. And then mention the 21 uh, centimeter redshift, which is uh, one of the fine line, hyper fine line of, of hydrogen. So the, the cosmic dawn or the reionization epoch is when, when you first begin to see the twilight right, uh, of, of, the, of the universe. Right? So you, if you're ever up early, really early in the morning, you'll notice that it's dark, but there's a little bit of light on the horizon, and then eventually it gets to be much more. And that's what, what we're going to see. Is that's kind of what happens until by the time you're a billion years into the age of the universe, the universe is starting to be pretty bright. There's lots of stars and lots of galaxies and everything is, is, is kind of good. And so how do you study this? this re how would you study some of the dark ages? And particularly, how do you study this epoch of reionization? Well, that's part of what you were trying to do with the quasars and then measuring the absorption line of the neutral hydrogen in front of them. But you can also try and use the gamma ray burst because the gamma ray burst produce very energetic bursts very early, you can see them all the way to the very earliest times in the universe. So in principle, you could see, you know, if you see absorption in, in the x-rays and so forth from that, tell you something about the material content. And likewise, you can try and use the 21 centimeter line from hydrogen to do it, although there are technical problems in it. And so we have, this is just a blow up of that region to show you, this is the part we're talking about, when you have the first, the first object starting to light up and send their light to us. And then we'll see if they're surrounded by hydrogen, only the light that's above a certain level can get through, right, or below certain lines of hydrogen can get through in order to be seen. And, and by the time we get to a billion years, we think reionization is essentially pretty much complete. We think the universe is neutral here, and we go through this period where our sources are turning on and they're beginning to ionize the, the medium in between that's gonna turn off some of the growth too. And, and eventually the universe becomes uh, transparent. And we know by a, by a redshift of six, or when well, the universe is seven times smaller than it is now, that the universe is essentially fully ionized. It's very close to fully ionized, except for the bird clouds of hydrogen have gotten very dense and can protect themselves. So in our cosmic history, we, uh, we've talked about the beginning. That's the hydrophysics part. We've talked about how structure develops over over uh, over time from the emission of the background radiation through the dark ages to the first stars and galaxies and the formation of more structure till we get supernova and black holes and and the proto galaxies and the modern galaxies and we we've made a cosmic microwave ground map that shows when the decoupling happens and we have the large scale galaxy surveys going on that tell us about the later time and then the question is what, what what's going to happen right in, in between time. Okay, so okay, so what happened at 380,000 years? That's when we believe almost all the free electrons are captured by the protons and a little bit of helium, and uh, at the few percent level, and became neutral atoms. Then you went from Thomson cross section to Rayleigh scattering, which is 14 orders of magnitude. The universe essentially becomes immediately transparent, and the light. From the microwave background, or the cosmic background, becomes microwave as the expansion as the universe expands, 
This is at a redshift of about 1100, and then the photons are free to travel to us. And the uh, you know before they're scattering all the time. Afterwards, they they scatter uh, very much less. Right? Okay, so the universe became transparent, right? And so we have the concept that if you're a photon starting out of the Big Bang, you're going to spend a lot of time scattering until you get to neutral atoms. So here is scattering and scattering. Of course, it's going back and forth. And then it comes right to where we're observing it, right? Once we have neutral hydrogen atoms. So there's multiple scattering before that's 380,000 years. It's like scattering inside the sun. And after that, it's like going from the sun to here. There's basically no, no scatterings going on. Okay, so when did the first, you know, how do we get from this uniform Big Bang to a sky full of galaxies? Well, we have to go through the part where we're going to make the first generation of stars and galaxies, and that's, the, you know, what's going on. And we want to know what happened before the first galaxies. The question is, can we see uh, back any further in time than that? And the answer is, it's not clear, but we know the universe was extremely uniform. This is actual data. I made this graph myself. This is the actual data. This is the microwave sky dominated by the universe. Our own galaxies in there too, but you can't even see it. But the, the universe was uniform to roughly uh, a part of 100,000 at the beginning. There were just tiny fluctuations and that they had to build up to become galaxies. And so there's a temperature history that as long as there's tight coupling between the matter and the radiation, the radiation is dominating, the temperatures are going to be the same, right? And that'll hold true out to the redshift of 1,000, right? 300,000 years or 380,000 years. But when hydrogen recombination comes, the matter no longer couples tightly to the radiation, and it can begin cooling. Right? And when, if, since that happens back at a temperature which is around 3,000 Kelvin, the hydrogen atoms are not relativistic, so their velocity gets redshifted down, so their kinetic energy goes down as the velocity squared, so half and b squared, so it cools more quickly. And so, oh, I'm sorry, I had a bunch of pictures of that. Uh, it scatters a lot when it comes to us. And then star formation, <laughs> and ionized gas around us that we have to worry about. Sorry, I have all these cute animations. <laughs> right? So the photons are scattered at the last, you know, at the late epoch, right? Then that, that will decay away some of the structure, but we see structure, so it clearly doesn't happen very much. And we see, we see the structure recombination. So now, once we had the matter, sorry, just, just cute animations for you to see. After we have the, the, the change, the radiation continues to just go down in temperature with the redshift, but the matter goes down as the redshift squared, one plus the redshift squared. So the matter gets cooler, right? And it's important for the matter to get cooler because it has to lose energy before it can clump, right? As long as it stays hot, it stays puffed up like this. Like like a, a gas, <coughs> the pressure is proportional to the temperature. So the pressure goes down and it allows the gravity to be able to work on to clump it more. And the dark matter gravity is the one that's going to do it. So we're going to go from the dark ages to having the first luminous object. We have to go from this period where the matter starts cooling and can dissipate energy and then collapse into the core, into the gravitational potential wells, and into the center of the gravitational potential wells that the dark matter forms. And What's our ecology at, at uh, recombination? According to our theory, we have Big Bang nucleosynthesis that's happening here as a function of the temperature, or here as a function of the time in seconds, where we think we have a ratio of protons to neutrons, which is set by the neutron decay lifetime, and the fact that there's a mass difference between them. So there's a, there's a, you know, a Boltzmann factor of e to the delta e over kT uh, uh, between the two, and. At a certain point, they're, they're starting to decay, but more they're being captured eventually, first into deuterium, but eventually up into the helium-4. And that leaves us in the end with 80% uh, of the mass in hydrogen and 20% in helium, right. and a smattering of these other things. And that's what we think the primary material is that's going to collapse to form stars. And cooling that down, making it cool enough so it can form a star, is an issue because there are not that many lines to radiate with. Once you start having carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and other molecules from them, they have many rotational and vibrational lines that allow them to dissipate energy 
tented. You know, so if you have friction in a gas cloud, it can dissipate its energy by radiating away and going along. So it's this first generation that's a tricky issue. So here's a little movie of how we think that might happen. So here's the perturbations growing. You see the structure forming and the voids forming. So this is redshift at the top. All right, you see the filaments forming and the filaments actually flowing together. It's a dynamical process. The pictures that I showed you before, some of them were snapshots. So we think there is a, a collapsing going on of the dark matter and we think that inside the dark matter is where the, let me show it to you one more time. Inside the dark matter is when the, when the baryons are, are freed, then they actually collapse in the center and then they have to dissipate energy, which the dark matter can't do, and collapse even to the cores. So they become like the residue in the bottom of the potential wells. So that in, in these really deep potential parts of the potential well, that's where you expect the baryons to first form and, and, and collapse down to be the first stars and galaxies. So this, remember on the scale of the baryon acoustic oscillations, they're three times as big. The baryon acoustic oscillations should be that big. So here's another sort of set of snapshots of pretty uniform dark matter, but still with the perturbations. Then part way where you see just the brightest spots appearing, and then eventually you see the cosmic web. And then at that point, the acceleration the universe is stretching things faster so that a more complicated web and more flow doesn't happen as much. So one of the things that we know is that we have emission absorption by hydrogen and there's a Lyman series. This famous, this is how quantum mechanics got started, was by measuring these properties. And, and by having the, the Lyman series, which, which was, you know, we have these formula and then quantum mechanics actually could reproduce the formula. But you have a continuum, but you have the first excited state which is up here in the ultraviolet. It's called the Lyman alpha line because that's how it's discovered. And this is one of the ways we know about how the epoch of reionization works. So there's a thing called the gunn peterson trough test that you do through Lyman alpha emitter. You find a source that emits in Lyman alpha and all the wavelengths down below, a lot of wavelengths down below. And then as you go through, occasionally the light will go through a small cloud and have a little bit of uh, emission or absorption, right? And then later on, it will happen again and again. And then you will go through a whole forest where these, these clouds are, are there, and you have dips in between, but you will have this kind of thing. And by studying what this shape looks like, you can study what the distribution of these, of these regions where there is either neutral hydrogen or ionized hydrogen, right? So if I have a hot source here, it'll ionize a bubble around it. A hot source here, will ionize a bigger hot source, it'll a bigger bubble. And if I have more, and there's many together, they will make interlinking bubbles, right? So if I have Lyman alpha emission and it's, and it's red shifting up over time, what I will find is that here all the neutral hydrogen will absorb, here it will pass through, so through these red shifts it will pass through, then it's all absorbed, through these red shifts it'll pass through, that's why it gets this bump, through this red shift it'll pass through, and here it'll pass through because it's ionized. So you can actually see where is the neutral hydrogen and where is it ionized by looking at this thing. So you can actually look at some real uh, some real spectra from a typical massive star, and it looks kind of messy. That's because a star is not a perfect black body. A sun is a pretty good black body, but it's not a perfect black body. So when you get up in the ultraviolet, and now the rest wavelength is unfortunately wavelength going that way, so energy is going that way. And then you can see how when you pass it through interstellar gas, all the short wavelengths, whoops, all the short wavelength stuff is absorbed and, <coughs> and has disappeared, right, after passing through the interstellar gas. And so you can try and make these measurements and see what, what goes on. And uh, so we got the quasar and we got us in our telescope trying to make measurements. And we have this structure in between and we're going to look to see if the hydrogen gas is falling on this dark matter web and see whether the structure looks right. And you predict you should see this thing which we call a Lyman alpha forest. Because instead of seeing, you know, it's like you can't see the forest because there's so many trees. You, you're going to have to try and figure out what's the depth of these lines and how many lines there are in order to see how much hydrogen there is along the way. 
and if you have more measurements, you know, better angular, res better spectral resolution, you can separate things out a little, a little better. So here is an example of a quasar, right? So this is the quasar, you know, 3C273 is a very famous quasar. It's at a redshift of 0.158, <coughs> and here's a quasar at a redshift of three and a half, right? And see how many more absorption lines there are here than in the nearby quasar, right? the nearby quasar. So this is telling you there's a lot more hydrogen, a lot more stuff in between that you can see, and you can then map, map out how much hydrogen there is between us and that distant object. So the thing about quasars is they're so bright, you can see them out to reasonably high redshift. So you can probe this later, later epoch. Okay, so here's the cartoon version of this, and here is the, the 3C273 again, and here's the one that's almost the same, redshift 3.6. So nearby, relatively nearby, still pretty far away, but very far across the universe with very much more absorption lines. Okay. So you do it in the observer's frame, then you have to actually go and look in the, uh, you know, into the, uh, the rest frame of whatever object you're looking at. But you will see this line now before us, and then you have to go back and reconstruct what kind of structure you're seeing in this this kind of thing. So now we have from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is the one that made the Million Galaxy Survey, you have an example here of things that are redshift of 6.4 down to a redshift, I forget what this one is, 5.7. Right? So they have very many quasars in this survey because they were, they were more than a million galaxies, so it's just about a million galaxies, but there's about 100,000 quasars. And so you can, you can look through this region between a redshift of 6.4 and the redshift of 5.7, and you can see, you see these Lyman alpha absorption regions sewing up, and you can see the neutral, you know, that the universe essentially gets fully ionized somewhere around this epoch, somewhere around a redshift of 6. Now, the question is, is it pretty ionized before then or not? Did it start getting ionized at 20, where there are very early stars, or did it not start getting ionized until a redshift of 8 or something? That's the question. And the fact that we saw a gamma ray burst at a redshift of um, you know, 8.2 is an indicator that at least some structure is formed by that, by that redshift. So this is the kind of uh, attempts that people are doing. And of course, you can say, well, it may depend on the particular line of sight. You, know, you have to measure enough quasars that you've got a fair sample of the different dif different places you're looking. And so there are, well, this, let me skip over this because we don't have enough time. But you, you can do some kind of an estimate of uh, what kind of absorption there is, depending on what redshift you are and how much energy you think is required to keep the universe ionized. The earlier you want to ionize the universe, the more energy you have to be pumping in to keep it ionized because the universe is expanding and things are cooling. But you need to keep the hydrogen at a temperature of 10,000 Kelvin in order to keep it self-ionized and until it gets so rare that it's hard for the electron to find the proton to recombine. And so it's, uh, you know, you have issues about trying to reionize the universe early. And uh, so the question is, when did that happen? And the answer is we think about 13 billion years ago and when the universe was somewhere around half a million years old, but it could have been a little earlier than that. And uh, so the problem is the universe was pretty much full of hydrogen atoms except at those first places that it formed. So it blocks any light passing through them unless you pick wavelengths that, that it can go through. Right? And then the proto galaxies and so forth. So we have this view that there is the, the, the dark ages and the first things turning on and they have to get denser and denser until the bubbles kind of overlap with each other and then you get a transparent universe. So let me skip over that and let me show you the animation. So here's the universe. Hopefully it'll start. All right, well, let's go to the next one. So here's a, a cubicle section of the universe and it's temperature, there's a temperature scale from 10,000 degrees, from 1,000 degrees to 100,000 degrees. And then I'll try and get the movie to start. So it's spinning around so you can see it. And there's the first source turning on. But remember, the universe is kind of opaque. And so there may be some stuff, other stuff inside besides those three that you can see. But you can't see them because you can't, the light can't make it through. And then you start seeing that there are bubbles forming, right? 
But it was pretty boring in the early universe because you can't see very far. It's like being in a fog, right? It's in the heavy rain in Paris. It's not as nice as when it's a beautiful sunny day and you can see everywhere. And you can see all the stars going off because there are clusters of galaxies. The, tend to, the bubbles tend to overlap when there are more stars and galaxies together. So you see that. And what you can see is there's a core. There's kind of a network of tunnels forming through the material where along those kind of uh, filaments. And then eventually the whole universe is going to become transparent. So this is a simulation based on you know, the, the assumption that we understand how the dark matter forms up and how the matter appears and then how the first stars turn on. And then you can see how it blows away. And you'll see, you see this as star forming regions in our own galaxy. You see that, well, they're going away, the pillars are going away. You have clouds that get a hole in them, then they divide up in the segments where there are pillars, and then the pillars go away and you're left with just, you know, a little bit of haze and even eventually the haze goes, gets, uh, gets ionized away. So there's stuff going on fairly early, but you can't see it unless you choose the white, right wavelength bands to look in where you can get through and, and that the bright objects actually <laughs> produce things with enough signal strength that you can see it. I think that's right. So did you want to see that again or you saw enough? <laughs> Is it boring? Was that, that, was, that was nice. It was what? <laughs> nice, very nice. really beautiful animation. Right, well, I mean, the question is whether you learn something from it. But it basically is there's stuff going on inside, but you don't know it. You, you just don't, you don't see it because you have to be very near one of the sources for the sphere to be big enough for the light to get to you in the ultraviolet, right, because the hydrogen blocks it. But you see there are these little spheres inside that are growing because more and more stars and more and more galaxies are, are lighting up, right, as the, as, the, as the baryons condense into the dark matter. Potentials, and eventually, when you have a cluster of galaxies, you get a whole, whole section around there, where it's all completely ionized. But, and because you have these long, this cosmic web of filaments and so forth, you will actually get ionization at the pot, at the center, and then they'll connect along the filaments, and then eventually it will come out to the, the to be the whole, the whole uh, universe being transparent. So when you measure light from a quasar. You think some of it's passing through the hydrogen and some of it's passing through ionized periods. Over the, that's why you see the Lyman alpha forest kind of activity. So there's Lyman alpha forest from the, from the fact that gas, some of the gas clouds are clumping to become galaxies. It's also because of the ionization. So it's a more complicated kind of a structure. And it takes a long time for the haze to get cleared out. Right, so if you're inside of the, inside the universe, <laughs> it's pretty boring. <laughs> You know, until suddenly it bursts upon you. It's like you know you're in the middle of Paris with all the lights being bright and everything, but there's a huge fog, and then suddenly, right, the fog clears and you can see all the bright lights and people waiting in line to get into the show and so forth. So the question is, how do you probe this region? You know, how do you probe what's going on? When did the first stars come on? When did they start making the higher elements? When is it possible for the first planetary systems to form? Right. That's a question that's of interest to people who want to study, you know, how prevalent life is in the universe. You'd like to know, did, did, the, did you get the heavy elements very early in the universe, or did you get them very late? Well, it's, it seems like they, they're fairly early in the universe. They're there by the redshift to five, and the universe is six times smaller. But, you know, did you get them even earlier? Could there have been civilizations even earlier than that? Okay, so how can we study the, the, dark, the, the dark ages? Right, the, the epoch of radiation of the dark ages. Well, the Lyman alpha forest observation is what you can get from the quasars and perhaps for a few really bright sources. You can do the Lyman alpha forest. You may be able to do the same thing with the gamma ray burst. The other thing you want to think about doing is radio imaging uh, of the hydrogen reservoir, the stuff that's out there. So we know the hydrogen is the dominant component of the universe, and its radiation is not blocked by cosmic dust because it's a long wavelength and also because we don't think there was much dust in the universe until at least the first generation of stars was going on. Now, the first generation of stars may have happened by 500 million years. The universe could have been quite a bit smaller, but we can see. So hydrogen has a rest frequency of 1420 megahertz. That is, uh, you know, in the middle of the wireless bands. It's in the middle, you know, in the middle of civilization. It's, 
it's not so handy. Right? <coughs> if you want to measure to a redshift of six, that's 200 megahertz, right? You're going to divide one plus z into that number. That's you know seven into that is 200 megahertz, right? Which just happens to be TV channels 11 through FM. So there was a lot of the reason I have these slides. Like, there was a lot of excitement and interest of people wanting to build detectors to map the redshift and to map the dark ages by measuring the 21 centimeter line. It turns out to be much more complicated. It's technically hard, but much more complicated physically too. <coughs> so you have to find right. You don't want to try and look for the stars in the city under a street lamp. You want to be in a dark site. Here you got to find a radio dark site, which means radio quiet. <coughs> and you have to figure out how to make the observations. Excuse me. <coughs> and, uh, but you can actually make measurements in 21 centimeters. Here's an optical picture that shows two nearby galaxies and actually another one. Because when you measure in 21 centimeters, you very quickly see that this is a small group of galaxies. There's a major spiral galaxy. There are two small satellite galaxies, two bigger satellite galaxies, and they have tremendous tidal interactions, right? And so if you look at our own group of galaxies, there's us and Andromeda, but there's about 43 members around where the two big galaxies, there are, there are groups of small galaxies around each of us, plus there's a triangular galaxy, which is fairly big and has a few small ones. We, we are tidally interacting with the Magellanic Clouds, there's a thing called the Magellanic Stream. There's a tidal distortion, the, just the differential gravity, pull as, as the Magellanic Clouds go along. Some of the hydrogen is pulled out the back of them, and it leaves the stream. And here you can see that kind of a stream around this galaxy, around the major galaxy. So it is possible to make 21 centimeter maps and see what's going on. It was one of the first sets of observations that I made. Was, uh, a big radio telescope was, was hydrogen lines. And so, forth. and so we want to go and look at this region, in, even out into here, if we can use 21 centimeter line. So the history of the 21 centimeter line was it was uh, called out in uh, 1945, and, and uh, possibly Shvatsky, who was a Russian theorist, and got people to do observations in 49. But the first published observations were in 1951, and it was uh, then understood by theorists uh, as a, a way to look uh, at, at neutral hydrogen out in the universe and in astrophysics it was in our own galaxy to start with. So it's a simple model. There are simple models you can make about the evolution of the of the brightness, the ionization of the brightness of the universe, and therefore the intensity of what you kind of expect. I, uh, you have to think about what's the heating rate, because now, remember I showed you what the temperature of the matter did with versus redshift, what the temperature of radiation does versus redshift. Now you're worrying about the spin temperature of the hydrogen atom, right? because it's the, it's, the, it's the proton spin lining or anti-aligning with the electron spin that's giving you 21 centimeters, the change of 21 centimeters. So you need to know what the spin temperature is of the hydrogen atom. And so you have to then make up models of what the temperature, what the excitation temperature is of what's going on in order to understand what's going on. But I'll tell you about the basics. The energy is very low. It's 68 millikelvin is the energy splitting between the up and the down state. And that spin temperature is generally, you know, greater than the astrophysical temperature uh, in most situations. So what gives the spin temperature? The absorption of cosmic microwave background photons, because this is an energy range of that. Collisions between hydrogen atoms and other hydrogen atoms and protons and free electrons. And the scattering, uh, it turns out, of Lyman alpha uh, and Lyman C photons, which is called the Wolfhausen field effect. So you then actually have to study what sets the temperature of this, and that becomos more difficult. So the, 20, the 21 centimeter line is the hydrogen hyperfine structure line. It's basically the nuclear spin either being aligned with the electron spin or anti-aligned. And the excitation temperature is equivalent to a temperature of 8 millikelvin. And it's the temperature between the spin and the CMB, because now you can see the cut this by because it's backlit by the cosmic microwave background. And so if it's colder or hotter than the cosmic microwave background, you will see absorption or emission. And therefore, you can look for it. 
And so it's the temperature difference right, ratio of, of that. And then there's a factor of the redshift, and then there's the occupation factor. And so there's simple formulas, but it's standard thermodynamic kind of, kind of arguments. And so now the question is, what about the couplings? You know, how does it work? Well, there's all kinds of atomic physics about how you can excite from this one up to these lines and back down to other lines. And this is how the Lyman alpha and the Lyman C photons are able to excite it. So, so now we go back to the thermal history, and we find that it's much messier than we would like. Right? I like really simple problems, and now I have to deal with a real messy universe, and I don't like it as much. So I was all excited about it when I first started hearing about it, and then when I found out you had to do all these details, and it matters how fast the stars turn on. So remember, the CMB and the hydrogen have the same temperature until we get to the decoupling. But the real decoupling is not a richness of 1,000. There's so many photons in the universe. There's roughly 10 to the 9 photons for every, for every proton, and therefore every hydrogen atom. It takes a longer time. It's not until you get to a redshift of about 150 does the temperature start deviating for the spin temperatures. Right? Because the CMB couples to the spins, and there are photons in the CMB that are at the same energy as the spin flip, so they couple. So they stay coupled until you get to a redshift of about 150. And then when the first generation of stars turn on, you start ionizing so the medium, and you start heating it up, and you have a competition between the ultraviolet photons and the collisions of the hot gas, making the spin temperature go one way or the other. So you have this thing where it gets pushed back to the CMB temperature, and then it gets pushed away. It's excited by becoming the same temperature as the collision temperature with the, with the hydrogen. <coughs> so the spin temperature is very complicated. It's the CMB temperature, then it splits away at 150. Well, that's good. I wasn't going to look back to 150. That wavelength would be so long that would you know, be difficult to do. But by the time I get here to a redshift of whenever the first stars and so forth are turning on, then I'm beginning to have it drift back towards the CMB. Then I have a blind spot where I'm not backlit, and then I have a temperature where it zooms up as the universe is reanimated. So it becomes a lot more, more complicated in terms of what's going on. So here is the, again the, the the 21 centimeter, you know the 21 centimeter interacting with the Lyman alpha and the Lyman beta, and how you how you you have to make up a model about the atomic motions and about the Lyman alpha photons, the spin and the CMB, and and work out these formulas. And it's simply a bunch of couple of differential equations that you have to do and and do this kind of thing. So it's not as pretty, and you also have to take into account the the Doppler broadening and, and the other stuff if you really want to be careful about it. So eventually you come up with some kind of a formula for how the gas temperature goes and the spin temperature goes, depending on how you turn the stars on and what happens and how it goes down and then eventually it turns up once, once things get to be, to be very, very severe. And so the spin temperature follows the CMB, it dips down below and then it zooms <coughs> up and then it actually saturates because the medium is thinner. Right. So now you're going to ask, what is the 21 centimeter brightness temperature in the local rest frame? Is 21 centimeters? Then you have to divide by one plus z, or multiply by one plus z to get the, the, the wavelength of, for the observer. You see that it goes cold and then it goes warm, and this thing that which was a flat blind spot for a while is now just a quick transition because it's the sum of many transitions along along what's going on. So I didn't like this because it's too messy, but is still an approach that people are taking. And uh, so, and this is all based on this hierarchical structure formation where we have a neutral hydrogen. We get a first few centers, and these centers then link together. And they link together, there's even, this doesn't show the detail, but there's even more structure because of the, the large scale uh, structure. So I have a 21 centimeter review in here, and then I have the, the, I, the concept of doing that people sold at the beginning, starting in 1997 when they first started talking about it about how you can do tomography. You can look back as a function of wavelength and get cross sections of the universe and see what's going on. And that's true, but it's more complicated because you have to actually understand what's, what's going on. So here's a set of things. Here's what the universe should look back at a redshift of, of 18.3. You should just see the beginning of the clumping of the, of the hydrogen atoms as they're falling into the dark matter potentials. Right? 
and then by 16 there should be a little more structure and then 14 and 13 right? and then you start to see places where you're getting you know formation of structure uh, it's playing itself automatically here so in principle by just measuring this you know putting out a detector that could measure the sky at all these different wavelengths you could you could make a slice and see this development over time because you get the 21 centimeter goes through quite a lot of things. Okay, so there are uh, now a number of projects that are ongoing. There's a list of them here. So the interesting thing is in Europe, there's a big effort called LOFAR, which was started by people in Holland. That's why the, the center, there's a big radio astronomy group in, in Holland. That's why the center's in Holland, but there are detectors everywhere because in order to get angular resolution, you know, the angular resolution you have is going to be, you know, land over diameter, right? And this is synthesis, right? So that if you actually look at the networks where you're going to have to do a synth uh, beam synthesis. But the idea is to have enough collecting area, enough thing to resolve to try and actually measure the, the 21 centimeter line as a function of redshift and also have enough angular resolution that you can actually see some of the structure and finer detail. So it's a very ambitious project, and I think it's it's a, a testament to human hope and optimism that is trying to be done in the middle of Europe. <laughs> because I cannot imagine there isn't going to be a lot of impact. Now, there is a, an effort in, uh, in China where they originally were talking about doing it in Inner Mongolia, which is here fairly close to Beijing. But now they're talking that they're going to move eventually out there. But the prototypes are being done here, you know, not so far from the Great Wall, not so far from from Beijing, and uh, they claim they're controlling the thing like that. The other place where there's a major effort is in Australia, where there's been a, a long history of, of radio observations, and here they're doing out in the desert of Australia, where it's relatively quiet, so you know, so they have some chance of making things work. Although these are very different kind of telescopes than you would normally think about, and so here is the here are the kind of receivers that are actually out there in practice, right? There are cell phone receivers, and some of these there are cell phone receivers. They've they've gone to cell phone manufacturers and just bought the amplifiers out of the cell phones, you know, directly from before they're put in the circuits, and and use them to make it. And you just make an array of receivers and you synthesize them. Now. This is the you know the artist concept of how it might look in the in the distant future, right? but this is this is how it actually looks now. <laughs> right? But that's not the, you know here is the the Chinese one, and you'll see it's a little hard to tell, but this is just a bunch of dipole antennas all in a row. Right? It's very simple, right? You can see it's in a deserty area, well snowy area at least, and. Uh, if, what you actually like to do is have these be in cylinders so that they focus in one direction and they're a wide beam in the other direction. Right? So, that, so that as the Earth rotates, you sweep this wide beam across the sky. Right? That's one way of making the maps. And so here's, a, here's one of the low-far prototypes before the folded, strange folded one. And here is one of the, the Australian prototypes sitting in red right strange soil. These are these antennas, and then they're just receivers, and you collect all the signals together and try and process them. So, right, so they, they, they couldn't do it at the site they wanted to. They've actually moved out further in the desert where it's even quieter. So this is the concept of <laughs> the test pieces that are there that tells you what it's like. And there is the hope that some place like a traditional radio astronomy will be able to do some of these measurements at the 21 centimeter line. So this is the very large array, which is the currently the biggest telescope array, which is in, in New Mexico, in a nice valley. So you see the ring of mountains around it, which keeps the thing going on. And there, there's innovation work going on, right? So this is the Australian one. You can see they're out in such a remote site, they have to get their electricity from solar cells. Right? That's good because that means there's not much noise behind it. But it's also, you know, this costs the most money, right? Because you want to have a lot of elements and everything. There are people trying to get the cost per, you know, per one of these things down, down to under 300 euros a 
a piece, so you can make a lot of them, right? And then you have to think about, well, do I make a regular array, <coughs> or do I, you know, like this, or I do that, and then I have a, one output, and then I put these out in a funny pattern, and then it's like a coded mass aperture. You, you, when you try and reconstruct what you have for the beam, it's the Fourier transform of all the pairs, right? And then you envelope the Fourier transform, so you'd like to have a sort of a random set of things. But you also want the cable runs and everything. So there's a deliberate effort here to have many different baselines right, and many different directions. You, it's, the, it's a vector thing that you're trying to deal with because you have the Fourier transform, and this is what the beam pattern will look like in, at the end. Sorry. So now we have a whole different way to observe the cosmos. We have the cosmic microwave background, the galaxy surveys, the type 1a supernova. That's a picture of a supernova. The big bang nuclear synthesis, where we're looking to see, you know, how much deuterium, how much original stuff. We hopefully we're going to do some nuclear hydrogen tomography, although I'm concerned about. It. We're starting to do the Lyman Alpha Forest. That's sort of the Sloan, and now we have the Sloan 3, the Boss survey, and things like that. And we're starting to do galaxy clusters, and we're doing gravitational lensing. So this is the kind of approach to try and understand what's what's going on in this this kind of a thing. And uh, I think. This is just more calculations. These will be in the notes. Not, not, I don't necessarily want to go through these now. So there are, there are various kinds of models that people are having to make about how the structure is forming and therefore what kind of a cur sets of curves you should get and what the absorption signature should look like and what the fluctuation should look like. And if you go out to, to larger redshift and you take angular power spectra, or three-dimensional three power spectra, so that you have k, the wave number. You expect perturbations, and you expect to see the variant acoustic oscillation showing up. And what the signature is for the formation of the first stars, you know, where you're going, making the transition from neutral hydrogen to the ionized hydrogen. And how you have a, the star, and then the ionized hydrogen region, and then the 21, centi 21 centimeter signature, and then the Lyman alpha sphere that's around it. And so, forth. so there's lots of different calculations you have to do, and for me this is this gets very messy. I'm, I'm going to skip through all this because I'd rather you guys be able. To, uh, these will all be in your notes, and uh, there's issues for 21 centimeters. We live in a galaxy, and if you look at its emission at 408 megahertz, right, which is one a redshift of one plus of two, basically, this is what our galaxy looks like. So you've got to look out in places where our own galaxy isn't, isn't disturbing you too badly. And this is just caused by synchrotron radiation, basically. This is energetic causing gray electrons spiraling in the magnetic fields of the, of the uh, galaxy, right? And so they, they produce synchrotron radiation, right? So that's what we're seeing here. And, and it was seen, it was seen in, the, in radio astronomy before it was seen in synchrotrons. And it was only after people realized they were losing energy and synchrotrons and did the calculations that then people understood what it was people were seeing out in, in the universe. So there's a lot more details. I don't want to spend the time on it here. I will rather leave time for you guys to ask questions. So there's a lot of information here about what you could do with 21 centimeters, provided you're able to make the measurements. It's not something that I like because it's much more complicated. But in fact, if you start making some signals, if you make the map, say, from a redshift of 1 to 2, you have a pretty clean situation where you can measure pretty well, just like I showed you that map of the cluster of galaxies, and you can see the tidal interactions and so forth. Actually, from a redshift of 0 to a redshift of 2, you probably will get a very interesting set of maps of what goes on. And that's technically relatively straightforward. can be done with existing kind of radio telescopes. Then to do the... The, the tomography is going to be more complicated because you have to understand, you have to do a back and forth to understand the reionization history of the universe in order to understand what's going on. Because the spin temperature is determined by this complicated intermix of the three 